and T.W. and others, and Landa Farah of Hillingdon and another. Yes, Mr. Ryan. Uh, I'm here with Mr. Lane of Hillingdon, Mr. Wise Queen's Council, Mr. Sitwala appear for T.W., S.W. and E.M. Uh, Mr. Burton sits behind me, appears for Mr. Gulu, and Mr. Squires, Queen's Council, and Mr. Butler for the Commission. Um, Lord, there is listed before the court an adjourned application by the Commission for permission to make oral submissions. I'm pleased to say that the proposed timetable in our replacement certain argument is now being the bar, and that timetable accommodates uh, the Commission's application, to which there's no objection from Hillingdon. Well, I, I think we're all uh, content with that. We've, we've, we've discussed it. Uh, two things to say about the uh, timetable. Uh, firstly, uh, those timings should be regarded very much as a maximum and not as a target, although there are clearly more than one issue and they are not all straightforward. Yes. Uh, we're not at the moment uh, persuaded that... Uh, or council to need all the time allotted. Yes. Uh, uh, and uh, secondly, uh, the split between the two cases, which yes. is effectively the way you have done it, well, I can see why you thought um, uh, best to do it, but uh, I would certainly hope that in your opening you would cover the common issues between your case and, uh, but sorry, but, but I, I between, between TW and Gulu. Yes, I, I intended to do that anyway. Yes. There's a lot of common ground here. Um, and uh, I certainly saw these as maximum timings, not as um, an Good. opportunity to go all the way to, well, to, enough to, said about that. to, to the wire. But I'm very grateful to the Lord, so we'll keep the uh, Lord's... Um, observations in, 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 in mind. Uh, the, each member of the court should have uh, before them seven bundles, that's core and supplementary in each uh, appeal, a joint supplementary bundle, and two uh, legal authorities bundles. It may be, my lord, that the authorities have um, split over into a third bundle. Okay. What we've so done is we've taken. Two bundles of authorities. Uh, a core in, in um, Mr. Gulu's case, I've got a core bundle, a supplementary bundle, and a, then a, something called a joint supplementary bundle. Yes. I think it's just both. And then TW, I've got three bundles. Ah. A core, a joint supplementary, and a supplementary. Yeah. Same thing. It's the same thing Mr. Lane tells me. As you well, let the joint supplementary bundle, my lord, is, is actually the same for both cases. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. So I've got two copies of the same. You've got two right. copies of the same. Yeah. The same. I'm grateful. Thank you. <laughs> um, look the same, but, um, anyway, never mind. In addition, um, the lord should have three main skeletons, a supplementary skeleton from Mr. Uh, Burton in the Gulu appeal, yes. mm -hmm. and a note from the commission that yes. came down yesterday. There's no objection on our part. Of Thank you. Well, this is any other housekeeping. Well, there's one matter which is not exactly housekeeping. We're a little bit puzzled as to why the uh, uh, respondents in TW are anonymised. It goes back, I think, to the beginning of the proceedings. Um, it may be better for me to... Make yes. Is there any reason why they should be anonymised? Uh, yes, my lord. Uh, because of the interest of the children. Why? Um, the mere fact there are children involved isn't a... Well, that, that, uh, that, that's correct. Um, when the matter came for trial at first instance and, and when there was consideration of the background facts of the case, there was considerable, or there was some uh, evidence about the interests of the children and moving schools and, uh, and, and so forth. And so there was some focus on the interests of the children at, at that point, and the judge who looked at the matter on the papers, I think it was Mr Justice Knowles, uh, determined that... Yes, I saw he'd made an order, yes. but his reasons don't tell you very much. No, they don't uh, tell you very well, much. I, I, forget I don't really want I to spend time on this now. I think, could you reflect about whether you really think that, that there are matters which require anonymisation? Mm -hmm. uh, because 
uh, in principle, we think it's important that uh, parties are known by their name. And that's obviously correct, my lord. Uh, and, uh, and as the case has progressed and we've narrowed it down to legal issues, it may well be that the imperative that yes. may have arisen at first instance... Well, thank you, Mr White. I don't want to bounce you with it. If you could reflect... I'll take instructions over the and we Exactly. At some point, we would like to reconsider it. Certainly. Thank you. Can I just raise one other question of housekeeping? Uh, in our supplementary bundle in TW, this one has got TW Lingham EHRC supplementary on its spine, document number two is uh, titled Officers Review of Social Housing Allocation Policy 2016. Uh, it is not dated, but it plainly postdates Mr. Justice Supperstone's judgment. Yes, it does. I'm not aware of any application to reduce fresh evidence, so what is the status of this document? Uh, Lord, I, I don't, firstly, I don't um, intend to uh, refer to it. What, what I do uh, in, intend to refer to is the judgment of uh, Deputy High Court Judge Collins Rice, Yes. Uh, which um, is material to this appeal, not least to the question of um, relief. And the deputy judge in that judgment refers to the office review. I'm happy to take it out of the fund, but there is no application to reduce fresh evidence. Uh, but I did want to take the court to that judgment. Right. Well, uh, very well about the review. And um, I have to say, however, that I have read it. And I find some of the material in it of some background interest. Um, so parties need to know that um, since it was in the bundle without agreement, like, I had, like my lord, I had a puzzle as to what its status was, but I thought there was no objection to our seeing it, so I have seen it. Well, it, 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 it is in the bundle. It's an agreed bundle. Uh, but the lord, with respect, the lord of Justice Lewis is absolutely right. Yes. It's fresh evidence in the uh, martial sense. There's no application. So it's not the ladder martial because it's post dated. Right, okay. uh, but we put it in because we wish to uh, bring the court's attention to the uh, judgment of the deputy judge on a judicial review claim that postdated yes. the justice subsidy, but was directly related to it. Yep. Bearing in mind that ultimately these are judicial review proceedings and the court, to an extent, looks at the current position. Now, finally, I know you want to get on. I was aware from the one of the skeletons, probably yours, of that subsequent decision from the deputy judge, but I haven't seen it. Have we got it? At the it's bundle? in the legal materials bundle. Uh, I think Is that the same as the authorities bundle? In the authorities bundle. Uh, I wish to see it now. No, I don't. I just didn't know. I, you, everyone was talking about it as if well, we I had thought, it, yeah. and I didn't know we had. But if we have, that's fine. Yeah, it's tab 41. In the, that case, for convenience, is known as TW number two. And we're referring to the case under appeal here as TW. Yes, OK, thank you. Well, now I see we have it, but I haven't read it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lord, lady. The Localism Act 2011 made uh, significant changes to the way in which local authorities provide accommodation pursuant to their functions under like Part 6 and 7 of the Housing Act 1996 which apply respectively to the allocation of housing accommodation and homelessness. In the homelessness context, the 2011 Act gave local authorities the power to bring their main housing duty to an end by making an offer of a tenancy in the private rented sector, known as a private rented sector offer, or PRSO. At the same time, the Localism Act 2011 made amendments to Part 6, not least to require housing authorities to set local qualification criteria for their allocation of social housing. And statutory guidance issued by the Secretary of State strongly encourages authorities to include a residency requirement as part of those uh, criteria. This power, my Lord, supplements pre-existing powers under the 1996 Act vested in local authorities to prioritise amongst the reasonable preference groups those applicants who can establish a local connection with their area. These two appeals concern the interface between those powers and the local authorities' statutory duties, primarily under the Equality Act 
2010, sections 29 and 149, uh, but also in the SW's case, Part 1 of the Children Act 2004. Uh, Mr. Gulu alone relies additionally on Article 14. The Commission has intervened in the case to generally support the claimants on the uh, arguments under the 2010 Act, but as below makes no submissions on Article 14 or, or Section 11. The issues arising in the TW appeal and the Gulu appeal are similar but not identical. Uh, the approach of the two judges below, Mr Justice Sufferstone in TW, Mr Justice Mostyn in Gulu, was in certain respects different, as my Lord Lord Justice Lewison observed when granting permission. The primary issues for this court in TW are whether Mr Justice Substein was wrong to hold, in effect, that Hillingdon's justification defence under section 19 fell at the first fence for the lack of any free assessment of the impact of the two residency provisions under challenge specifically on Irish travellers, and whether, as Hillingdon submits, the judge ought to have asked himself on the material before the court whether the measures were objectively justified. Secondly, there's an issue, an important issue, we say, concerning mitigating measures, or what have been called in the cases, safety valves. So in, what, what were you describing as the first issue? The first issue is whether Mr Justice Subsistent fell into error this is ground one, in uh, effectively dismissing Hillingdon's justification defence at the first stage on yep. the ground that Hillingdon had failed to pre-assess the injury. Yes, so sorry. No, as you say, it's just ground one. I, I had ground one. Yep, yep. And then ground two of our appeal raises the question of mitigating measures or safety valves. In um, the case of the Queen on the application of H against the London Bar of Ealing, the case that my Lord the Vice President uh, was uh, uh, a member of the court hearing that case, uh, this court held that it is permissible at the justification stage of Section 19, but not before, to look at the policy in the round, including other measures contained within that policy, as mitigating the impact of the discrimination. Now, they have been known in uh, the cases, Mr Justice Mossin wasn't happy with the expression, but known generally as safety valves. But these cases ask the important question, what is an effective safety valve? Is it one that peculiarly favours the protected group who are suffering disadvantage, in this case Irish travellers, on account of their protected status? Is that the position, that's uh, TW's case supported by the Commission, or is it a provision which in the context of a housing allocation scheme is capable of recognising and responding to any enhanced housing need that may result uh, as a, uh, due to that protected group um, status? And that's the difference between the parties, and that's a matter of considerable operational importance for local authorities in framing their allocation scheme. An allocation scheme prioritises between applicants in a way which will almost inevitably involve detriment and indeed prima facie discrimination. So how can local authorities frame their schemes in such a way as to justify those effects when they arise? Um, the context, the regrettable but nonetheless um, realistic context in which these issues arise are a London borough uh, where the demand for social housing from households with a demonstrable need for rehousing outstrips supply by a factor of more than four to one. My Lord, um, by way of route map, our submissions will follow the order of our appeal skeleton, which itself broadly follows the order of the judgments below. And I shall begin, therefore, if it's convenient, with the housing uh, legislation framework and the policy. But before I do that, um, if I may, I'd like to say, make a short point about the Gulu appeal. It's a matter I've raised uh, with uh, 
counsel in that case, but I want to flag it up now um, so that the court um, can understand Kennington's um, position. Um, the Lords will know that it's only comparatively recently that we've had uh, the submissions from the Commission in this case, and they post-dated the party's skeleton arguments. A number of the points that the Commission make, Killingdon does not accept. However, one point Killingdon makes is about, oh, sorry, the Commission makes, is about the call for comparison in this case. And at paragraph 20, sub-Roman 4, Mr. Squires and Mr. Butler say that the correct call for comparison is, quote, all those seeking social housing in Hillingdon, which, on the face of it, is wider than the call that Mr. Justice Mostyn applied in Gulu of new residents. Now, Lord, to cut a long story short, I'll elaborate upon this at the moment. I seem to want to flag it up at the moment. Uh, the Commission rely in support of that on paragraph 41 of Baroness Hale's judgment in the Essop case, which is not in the bundle, but two members of this court are well familiar with it. We've, Mr. Lane and I have looked at this very closely, and we think that although that passage is obitic, it does support the Commission's point. And having thought about this and discussed it with the borough solicitor, um, we don't feel that it would be right in a case of this importance, which is principally about justification and raising very important points for consideration by this court. We don't think it's right in the light of that. We're grateful to the Commission for raising ESOP. It wasn't raised before the judge, below. We don't think it's right that we can support uh, Mr. Justice Bonstein's comparator. But also, a lady would have seen that below we made a concession about prima facie discrimination, which the ju uh, Mr. Justice Subsidy accepted, Mr. Justice Boston didn't. And we think that on reflection, and it's, I, I'm sorry this is late, but it's taken time to yeah. think about this, we think that ESOP does support the, uh, the concession we made. So this what it boils down to is you are conceding that the correct pool is all those seeking social housing yeah. in, in Hillingdon. Right. And that insofar as Ms. Justice Mostyn proceeded on a different basis, you don't seek to support it. Is that what it comes down to? It comes down to that at this level. I obviously reserve my position if this case goes any further. But does that mean, Mr. Rutledge, that you are conceding that a residence requirement is indirect discrimination in both cases? Uh, no, because we say it's justified. Well, well it's not fine. So yeah. That indirect discrimination can be justified. We, yes, we go. You say it is. Is indirectly discriminatory, but you say it's justified. Yes. Well, or we go back. We go back to the concession that we made um, before Mr. Justice Mostyn. Yeah. Uh, we don't want to waste the court's time. We no, don't no. want to go off on bad point. Essop does seem to support the line we took before. I, I'm, I'm afraid I didn't bother to look at it because, as you say, I'm fairly familiar with it. But I'd assumed it was in our bundle. Is it not? No, no. no well, it's we not. Better have, we better have it. has copies of it. Okay. Well, we I, it. It may be we can take this matter further. If my lord's lady will require a note from us on this, we'll produce it. Well, not at the moment, I think. We'll I just want to flag it up at this. No, stage. no, it's so very helpful know, that you have done so. Um, yeah. I think as we're dealing with the point, shall we? Let's have S up yes. now. Can we have that? Okay. I'm not asking to be taken to it. Just no, no. I'm great. I'm great. So the bottom line is, in both cases, even more bottom line than the one I put to you before, is that in both cases, uh, the only issue as regards the um, Section 29 case is justification. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we're, I'm grateful for, uh, for uh, the Lord for clarifying that, because that is very much the point. I'm not, I'm not under, understating the Section 11 point by any means. I can't bit. speak um, for my Lord and my Lady, but... Uh, so, I can't speak for my lord and my lady, but uh, myself, that's how I've always approached it. So, um, As have I. Yeah. That, that, that's very reassuring. That's how we've looked at it. Thank you very much. Can, yeah, I've got a copy, thank you. Can I go then to um, the Housing Act 1996, which is Act Tab 1 of our uh, authority bundle?
we, we deal with this in paragraphs 15 to 20 of our skeleton, and in Mr. Justice Sutterstone's judgment, it's at 5 to 8. And I'm going to invite the court to look at the uh, framework. I know this is very familiar to my Lord Lord Justice Lewison, his recent Dodson judgment goes through part of it. But it's, in, it's a very important framework for the purposes of this appeal. So we're looking at tab one of the Housing Act of 1996. And which page? Uh, well, I'm going to start, uh, invite the court to start at page 42, which is the opening of part 7. Oh, I'm so sorry. 23. 23. 23. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. This is part 7 of the Housing Act 1996, and this is concerned with homelessness. This is a part of the Act that we underwent substantial amendment last year uh, by the Homelessness Reduction Act. Uh, which is only of marginal importance to, to our case. But well, hang on. Uh, is, is what we've got here the act as it stood at the time with which we're concerned? No, you, 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 you have the act as it is. In all material respects, it's exactly the same. Okay. The, the, the Homelessness Reduction Act does not impact on any of the provisions that we're looking at here. We can provide an earlier copy... I think it would be helpful, um, yes. simply because one will have to... 3rd of April 2018 it came into effect, so it's before the judgment. It, it's just a purely practical point, when with setting out the judgment, one wants to set out the Act as it was at the relevant time, yeah. uh, and uh, I haven't quite worked out what the relevant time is, but let's just, can we have it in both versions? Okay, but we're happy to use this one if there's no yeah. um, material difference. Now, the, the, the scheme of Part 7, broadly speaking, uh, comprises definitions, duties, and review rights. So we have definitions. I don't need to take much time on this. Uh, 175, we have the definition of homelessness and threatened homelessness. And then at page 42... Section 185 defines eligibility. Uh, Mr. Gulu is eligible uh, as a refugee because he has um, leave to remain. But can I just, while we're here, invite the court to look at 1854, uh, which says a person from abroad who is not a eligible for housing assistance should be disregarded in determining for the purpose of this part when a person falling in within subsection 5 has a priority need. That's the Morris provision um, that has some relevance to the Article 14 point. I just flagged up so the court sees where it is. So the first hurdle or requirement is homelessness. The second is eligibility. The third is uh, Page 49, Priority Need. And then the final uh, threshold question is at page 59, Intentional Homelessness. And before I go to just the, making a note, uh, uh, where's priority need? 189. Yeah. And just before I go to the main duty, if I just pick up uh, 199, which is at page 82, that's the definition of local connection. Subsection 1, a person has a local connection with the district of local housing authority if he has a connection with it because he is or in the past was normally resident there and that resident is or was of his own choice. And then just going down to subsection 6, there's a provision that came in by way of amendment following the decision of the House of Lords uh, concerning former 
um, asylum seekers um, deeming uh, them to have a local connection to the area in which they were provided with um, central government support. So that's 199. And then we go to the duties. So, so sorry, where was, the new, where was the new provision? Section 199, subsection 6. Yes, I see. Thank you. Yeah. Then we go to the main duties, and we begin at page 31, section 179. This is important to our case, we say. Yeah, sorry, I'm just being a bit slow. Where, where, where are we going now? Page 31. Page 31, right. 31, we go back. So yes, of course, of course we do, yep. So we've looked at the main definitions. Yep. We're now looking at the duties. Yep. 31, the general functions in relation to homelessness or threatened homelessness. Duty of local housing authorities to provide advisory services. Each local housing authority in England must provide or secure the provision of a service available free of charge, uh, etc. Preventing homelessness, securing accommodation. It's a general duty to provide advisory services. And then if we go to page 57, this is what's known as the limited housing duty. And it's a duty owed to um, applicants who um, are homeless, are eligible, have a priority need, could have become homeless intentionally. And subsection 2 uh, requires the local authority to do two things. Firstly, to secure that accommodation is available for occupation for such period as the local authority consider will give them a reasonable opportunity to securing accommodation for his own occupation. The code of guidance says a few weeks. Generally, it's longer than that. Um, and subpara B, to provide um, or secure is provided with advice and assistance. So those are the twin duties owed to the intentionally homeless. And then uh, Lord, we come to the main duty at page 61. The section 193 uh, duty. And this is a, a duty that the Lord Lord Justice Lewison looked at recently in God's and, uh, judgments. And it's well known. And uh, we see from subsection 1 that this duty, uh, or this section applies where the local authority is satisfied that an applicant is homeless and eligible, um, not satisfied that he became homeless um, intentionally, um, and also satisfied that he has a priority need. And then the main housing duty under this part arises in subsection 2, unless the authority refer the applicant to another the local housing authority, and that's the local connection provision uh, I took you to. They shall secure that accommodation is available for occupation by the applicant. It's not time limited, it used to be, but now it's an open ended duty. Uh, the subsection 3, the authority is subject to the duty, subject to the duty under the section until it ceases by virtue of any of the following provisions of this section. So once all the definitions are satisfied, there's a main housing duty, it's an ongoing uh, duty, and it comes to an end when one or other of the cessation uh, provisions apply. And if we look at subsection 6 um, and scroll down to little c, we see that the main duty ends if the applicant accepts an offer of accommodation under part 6. So the making of a part 6 offer brings to an end the part 7 duty. But by amendment, uh, if we go over the page, page 63 at the top, this is a product of the Localism Act, and I mentioned it in my opening. 7AA, the authority shall also cease to be subject to the duty under this section if the applicant, having been informed in writing of the matters mentioned in 7AB, either accepts or refuses uh, such an offer. And then the matters are the possible consequences of refusal of the offer, that the applicant has a right to request a review, and the effect of section 195A. We don't need to worry about the restricted cases, that's a product of the Morris case. Uh, uh, private sector, private rented sector offer of land, rightly, can be insured short of. Yes. For a year. Minimum of one year, yeah. yes. 
and uh, in the fact the law is referring to section 7AC, which we now see, the purpose of this section, an offer of a PRSO, an offer of an assured shorthold tenancy made by a private landlord to the applicant in relation to any accommodation which is or may become available for the applicant's occupation, is made with the approval of the authority in pursuit of arrangements, etc., and the tenancy being offered a fixed term tenancy for a period of at least 12 months. And subsection 7F says the local authorities shall not A, B, approve a private rent, etc., offer, PRSO, unless they're satisfied that the accommodation is suitable for the applicant, and that subsection 8 does not apply. And subsection 8 is about uh, pre existing contractual arrangements. So th this is all a product of the Localism Act. For the first time, local authorities can discharge into the private sector in a way, A, that brings to an end their full their main duty, but B, in a way that um, brings that duty to an end, even if the applicant refuses the offer, provided it's suitable. Now, not surprisingly, that carries review rights, and I will take, I'll take thought to those in a moment. That's the scheme. But I need to just show the court section 195A, which is at um, page 76. <coughs> this is part of the PRSO scheme. If within two years, beginning with the date on which the applicant accepts a PRSO, the applicant reapplies for accommodation in obtaining the accommodation, and the authority is satisfied that the applicant is homeless and hasn't become homeless intentionally, then the main duty, 1932, is reinstated regardless of whether the applicant has a priority need. So that's the, that, that, that's the, 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 the assurance that the applicant gets. Uh, if I take this PRSO for a minimum of 12 months, and I become unintentionally homeless as a result, I can go back to the local authority. If my children have left home and gone to university, I can still be treated as an, uh, a, a main duty applicant, even though I no longer have um, a priority uh, need. So that's the PRSO scheme. Can I just uh, take the court now to the review rights, which are important? Section 202. Page 89, page 89, section 202. An applicant has the right to request a review of, and then uh, can we look please at little, firstly little d, that's any decision of the local authority as to what, if any, duties owed to him under sections, and they include section 193. So if the local authority says we've discharged our duty under 193, the applicant can seek a review under that. Over the page, the left uh, a review of any decision as to the suitability of accommodation in discharge, and specifically under G, again a product of the Localism Act, any decision of a local authority as to the suitability of accommodation offered by way of a PRSO. And 1A, down the page, 1 capital A, an applicant who is offered accommodation. Uh, can request a review of the suitability of the accommodation. So uh, 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 those are the review rights. Can I just, uh, one point I need to mention, at 90, page 93, this is important when we go to section 11, round three, but page 93, we have section 203, which sets out the procedure on review. And if we look at subsection four, we see that if the decision is A, to confirm the original decision on any issue against the interest of the applicant, they shall not also notify him of the reasons for the decision. So there's a duty on the local authority uh, if it issues a, uh, a review which is against the interests of the applicant to furnish uh, reasons. And Lords, those... Um, there's a right of appeal to the county court on the point of law. Uh, the, the, the Lords ahead of me, that's page 95. So uh, the, the scheme is clear. That yes, the this isn't Localism Act stuff, this has always been there. The yeah. right of review. And, so right, but, and, 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 and we see subsection 3, the court can confirm a partial bearing decision as it thinks um, fit. Um, and that, uh, part 7. Can we now please go to part 6, which starts at page 2 of the, of the photocopying. Uh, 
by comparison, part six contains few duties, more powers, but the duties are very important. If we begin with section 159, this is headed part six, allocation of housing accommodation, introductory. 159, we begin with a duty, a local housing authority shall comply with the provisions of this part in allocating housing accommodation. Then it defines uh, what accommodation is. And then um, on page three, subsection seven, subject to the provisions of this part, a local housing authority may allocate housing accommodation in such manner as they consider appropriate. Now they have to comply with this part, but subject to that, um, they have uh, a, a comparatively free hand in deciding how best to um, allocate. If we go to page seven, I'm afraid the, the numbering of this part is rather bizarre due to the number of amendments. But we go to, and we need to be careful that we're looking at England and not Wales. Um, but we hope that Mr. Lane, as reliable as ever, will get the right versions in the bundle. 160ZA uh, deals with allocation only to eligible and qualifying persons. So it introduces two concepts one of eligibility, the other of qualification. Eligibility broadly mirrors section 185 in part 7 and excludes, with exceptions, certain persons from abroad. And um, th that's written in stone. You cannot, the local authority cannot override that in any way. That, 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 that's, that's plain. Uh, but uh, relevant, very relevant to our case is subsection 6, which says that except as provided by subsection 1, a person may be allocated housing accommodation by a local authority, whether on his application or otherwise, uh, is a qualifying person within the meaning of subsection 7. And subsection 7 says, subject to subsections 2 and 4, then the eligibility provisions and any regulations issued under subsection 8, a local housing authority may decide what classes of persons are or are not qualifying persons. So there's uh, a generally free hand for these local authorities to decide who should qualify. Uh, for um, housing. Now, th that's, uh, th this court <coughs> has looked at a very important point of that, and I'll take you uh, to it in a moment. And uh, uh, we can see it's subsection 8 power is given to the Secretary of State to prescribe classes or prescribe criteria that may or may not be used. So the Secretary of State can say no residence provisions, unlikely to, in light of this guidance, but could do, but could do so. Um, are there any such regulations? I don't mean... There, 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 there are, um, yes, there's uh, what's called um, uh, right to move. Um, I don't think they're... We, we would put them in if we... They were, I no, no, don't worry. I, I just, for background knowledge, there, there are some regulations, but yeah. none relevant to this case. Yeah. Yep, okay. Um, and then subsection 9 uh, gives a right of review uh, if... Um, uh, for an applicant who's told that uh, she or he doesn't qualify. So there are review rights for part six as well. But no appeal rights. <coughs> but no appeal rights. No, no. Uh, it, it, no doubt there's a reason for that, but uh, so it would have to be judicial review if, if, if uh, it was said that the review was unlawful in some way. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the reason for it. Mm. Um, it's odd because the whole thrust of the previous legislation it, it, it was, um, but I, 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 I looked at it at the time, my lord. I couldn't see any reason why it applied to part seven. Part, it, it, remember, the review rights came, uh, the appeal rights came in 23 years ago, mm. um, and part six was quite a different model then to what it is now. It's been substantially amended. So perhaps that's one that's right for consideration by Parliament if and when it has time. Um, and then 166 at page 9. A local authority shall secure that advice and information is available. Sorry, advice and information is available free of charge. 
to persons in their district about the right to make an application for an allocation of housing accommodation. Again, it, it, it mirrors part seven. This is all part of a, a comprehensive scheme, not only to give accommodation, but also to provide advice and assistance. Uh, and can I just, uh, in passing, mention subsection four, um, only because of some of the references in this case. The fact that a person is an applicant for an allocation of housing accommodation shall not be divulged without his consent to any other member of the public. So we need to, all need to be careful when we look at some of the evidence which may refer to specifically to other cases. And then 166A is uh, of particular importance to this appeal. Paragraph e, uh, page 11. And this says, allocation in accordance with the allocation scheme. Uh, there's a duty at subsection 1. Every local housing authority must have a scheme for determining priorities as to the procedure to be followed in allocating housing accommodation. So there's a duty to have a scheme. And then subsection 2 says the scheme must include a statement of the authority's policy on offering people to be allocated accommodation a choice. And Hillingdon operates, as most local authorities, a choice-based letting scheme. And then subsection 3 is of particular importance, and this is, goes back for decades in housing law. As regards priorities, the scheme shall, subsection, subsection 4, be framed so as to secure that reasonable preference is given and to and in five groups, which include the statutory homeless, but also people occupying in sanitary overcrowded housing, people who need to move on medical welfare grounds, people who need to move to a particular locality. They're all cases of housing need. And Parliament says that every scheme must be framed so as to give a reasonable preference. I'll come back to that expression in a moment. Preference over whom? Well, um, when we look at the uh, Jakinda pursuit case, uh, we will say, with reference to paragraph 50 of Lord Justice Richard's judgment in that case, uh, preference over those who don't get on the scheme. So you can have your reasonable preference be when you're lowest band and it would be lawful. Um, otherwise, you have to, contrary to the whole spirit of the 2011 Act, bring in people on the scheme who have no prospect whatsoever of ever being rehoused, they're only there to give a reasonable preference to others. That can't possibly be the law. Um, so uh, we say, and you, do, you can give a reasonable preference to these groups by excluding everybody else yes. from the scheme. Yes. Uh, and then um, I was at the foot of our page 11, uh, there's a uh, following the reasonable preference categories, there's a power. The scheme may also be framed so as to give additional preference to particular descriptions of people uh, within the reasonable preference groups, being descriptions of people with urgent housing needs. And then... Um, over the page, uh, there are provisions which uh, the court will see arise in a number of places here concerning the Armed Forces Covenant. Priority must always be given. There are statutory instruments dealing with this uh, for um, uh, those serving in the regular forces or formerly um, served uh, and so on. And subsection 5, which we have on page 12, subsection 5, the scheme may contain provision for determining priorities in allocating housing accommodation to people within subsection 3, and the factors which the scheme may allow to be taken into account include the financial resources available to a person to meet the needs, any behaviour of the person, and C, any local connection within the meaning of section 199 which exists between the person and the authorities district. This is important for uh, our case on both appeals that there is there a power to prioritise amongst the reasonable preference groups uh, inter alia on grounds of local uh, connection. And then uh, subsection 6 gives power... So if you'll just pause, pause a moment, Scott, please. So the priorities in subsection 3... Yes. Um, ...are not, so to speak, in order of any preference... No. As between themselves. No. But five allows for 
allows the local housing authority to to make to give priority to as between those various yeah. groups. And interestingly, the reason is just not as between those various groups or even as between people within those various groups. This isn't is it just priority within as it were as between A, B, C, D, and E, or can you split them up and make your own subgroups or overlapping groups and give priorities to those? I think it must be the latter, mustn't it? Mr. Lane thinks so. The agree with a lot on that. that, that that's probably right. Well, I, I only just came by the language. Thought it through, but um, it says people within subsection three. Yeah. Thank you. And then, so you're getting um, the there on there, aren't you? First of all, having the, cre the creation of the reasonable preference group, and then you're uh, then you've got the ability to prioritise within the reasonable preference yes. group. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, it's not I going that way, it's going that way. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 much of this will become clear when we look at the House of Lords um, decision in the Ahmad case. Um, and then uh, subsection 9, uh, page 13, subsection 9, uh, the scheme must be framed to secure uh, that an applicant for an application has the right to request such general information as to enable him to assess essentially where he stands. So there's a transparency requirement. Subsection C is a review, right? Um, and then subsection 11, subject to the above provisions and to any regulations made, the authority may decide on what principles the scheme is to be framed. And then subsection 12 is concerned with how this scheme, the scheme operates within the broader strategic obligations of the local authority. Subsection 13 is about amending the scheme consultation. And then subsection 14, a local housing authority shall not allocate housing accommodation except in accordance with their allocation scheme. So you've got to have a scheme, you've got a client, but within um, the um, parameters of section 166A, there's comparative um, freedom. Uh, can I just um, pick up two questions that might be thought to arise? out of that statutory framework. The first is what is meant by reasonable preference. And can I invite the court please to turn to tab 23 of the authorities bundle. <clears throat> so the case of uh, the Queen on the application of Lynn against none of our apartment. with section 1672, which is now 166A3, the reasonable preference categories, does not depend on outcomes. The duty is to give reasonable preference merely requires the giving of what Lord Justice Judge referred to in the corresponding previous legislation in uh, Queen on the Upcat, uh, uh, ex ex-party waxers, uh, as a, uh, a reasonable head start. And then this preference should not be confused with prospects of success. Prospects of success depend on many factors, of which the most material is the fact that the demand for accommodation greatly exceeds the supply. It's quite possible for a lawful scheme to give reasonable preference to a person within 1672, and that person never to be allocated Part 6 housing. Such a person is entitled to no more than a reasonable preference. And then it goes on, section 1672A, uh, that's now 166A5, expressly commits the authority to determine priorities as between groups within 1672. The fact that the homeless person is accommodated afforded fewer points than other persons within 1672 cannot be ground for challenge to an allocation of scheme. And then the second point, uh, 
um, is uh, how does how do, how does the uh, reasonable preference criteria sit with the qualification criteria? Because on the face of the statute, a local authority could simply disqualify or refuse to qualify anyone in the reasonable preference groups. Not suggesting they would, but that's on the face of it. That was answered by this court in the Jakima Pursuit case, which is at tab 26. And this has historical context uh, for our case, for reasons I'll explain in due course. But uh, essentially, I think I can just summarise the position here by reference to the head note. Um, Hammersmith and Fulham Council did not put their statutory homeless on their housing register if they were in long-term suitable accommodation uh, because they didn't think it was necessary to do so um, and it gave a greater chance for everyone else to get the accommodation. But, of course, the statutory homeless are one of the reasonable preference groups. So what took priority? And in short, uh, Lord Justice Richards giving the main judgment to the court held at paragraph 26 that um, uh, reasonable preference is the uh, fundamental requirement of the legislation and cannot be over overridden. But the real reason I take the court to uh, Jakima pursuit is because what Lord Richards says, Lord Justice Richards says at paragraph 50 in conclusion with which um, Lord Justice Tomlinson uh, expressly agrees. Um, five lines down, if those falling within uh, paragraph 214D, that's of the scheme, have a lesser need for social housing than other people within the reasonable preference classes, the council may wish to consider whether it is possible to reflect that factor in an appropriate banding structure under the scheme in place of the impermissible excluded uh, affected by paragraph 214. 2.14. So you've got to include all your reasonable preference people within your scheme, but within the bounds of rationality, you can prioritise them accordingly. You can put them in different bands, which was very helpful for local authority. And it, it, that was very much behind the modification of Hillingdon's scheme in 2016. Hillingdon had a scheme that was similar to Hammersmith and Fulham's in that the statutory homes weren't on it. But when that came through, it caused them to review the matter and to amend it, as we'll see uh, in due course. Can I then go, please, to the um, statutory guidance? Which I haven't actually taken us to the provision requiring uh, statutory guidance to be... Was that what you were about to take us to? I should have done that. I'm sorry that I didn't. It doesn't matter. It's 169. 169. 169. Okay, well, I mean, I think we can take it as read. Um, I, I'm very grateful to the law for... for pa pa power to um, uh, impose... Sorry, power to the Secretary of State to give guidance and uh, duty on local authorities. Is it to have regard? Have regard, yeah. Uh, shall okay. have regard to such guidance as maybe yep. times... Okay, well, well, that's all we need. I'm grateful yep. to the law for that. It was in my notes. So Don't worry. Um, the guidance I, I wish to uh, draw the court's attention to is the December 2013 guidance, which is at uh, tab 55. So, um, that this is guidance issued to section 169 to which local authorities shall have regard. And subsection as paragraph 4 um, encourages local authorities to review their existing allocation policies and revise them where appropriate in the light of this guidance. Um, then we have purpose of guidance. Uh, five, social housing 
statement is some forms of normalcy. <coughs> the millions who live in now, uh, those who look to it to provide support for the future, the ways to allocate, the ways it's allocated key to create the communities when people choose to live and they able to prosper. The government's made it clear they expect social homes to go to people who genuinely need and deserve them. That's why the localism act to maintain the protection of right by the statute using the preference criteria and so on. Seven, the localism act has also been if, if there are long chunks you're going to read us, you want us to read, yeah, just um, tell us which they are and we'll read them. Yeah, I, I, can, I, I want to make progress, so can we, uh, I wonder if I... Can I, just I have to say, it's been very helpful to have this. We are taking a lot of time on the statutory provisions, not yeah. all of which are material to the issues, are they? Um, I sorry. Hope, I hope they are, but... Uh, I, I'm, that I'm, may be an unfair criticism. I'm just saying, yeah. saying, yeah, as you say, we need to make progress. I, I'm, I'm conscious of the time. I'm yep. conscious of the Lord's um, direction on timing as well. I'll, I'll make... Uh, uh, keep going. Keep, I keep going, yes. Can I, in that case, can I please just flag up arrows 5 to 7... Ten, and then particularly qualification for social housing eleven to thirteen. Yeah. And thirteen is where, um, when I open this case, strongly encouraged can be found. This is in relation to residents, uh, such as the Secretary of State believes a reasonable period of residency would be at least two years. Um, and then over the page sixteen. Whatever qualification criteria need to have regard to the duties under the Equality Act. Um, and in section seven, uh, paragraph 17 is important about housing options. And then, can you please note under providing for exceptions, para 21, that's important to my case. Um, in, a, in addition, authorities retain a discretion to deal with individual cases where there are exceptional circumstances. So the Secretary of State is there envisaging safety valves, we say. And then over the page uh, 26 and 27 are prioritising local connection. And then paragraph 30 is about information. Sorry if it sounded those, I was at the races, but I, I just want to get... No, no, that's the, been uh, very helpful. Uh, can I go? Well, no, sorry, no, that's yes, well, just to slow you down for one second, having tried to speed you up. Um, yes, I see. So, prioritising local connection for our purpose doesn't add anything to what we've already seen about residence requirements. No, 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 no. I'm just showing you this because it's part of the essential um, yes. background to what they can do. Can, can we go then, uh, as uh, uh, the order of Mr Justice Substance Judgment, to Hindon's allocation policy? Yes. It's the 2016 policy um, that we're looking at, which is in the joint supplemental bundle at tab 9. Lucky we have two copies then. We have a spare copy. I'm no, sure. I meant we. With this bundle, we've got two. We've all got two copies. Oh, I see. Your lordship has. Uh, oh, I see. You okay. Anyway, we. Yeah. Tab nine. We have it. We have it now. Uh, this is the December 2016 version. Uh, we will see later. There was a 2013 version. They yeah. first came in there, but this is the uh, policy uh, under challenge. And. Um, Essentially, it's a choice-based banded scheme that Billington operates uh, with discretionary override. If you could just go through again, uh, the law will slow me down if I'm going too fast, but I'm conscious of time. Yes. Uh, but can we start, please, at page um, 171 of the aims? says at the foot of 171 that the policy complies with, amongst other things, the Equality Act. 
And then at 172, we have the aims of the policy. Now, the allocation scheme designed to meet all legal requirements and support contribution towards the Council's wider objective of putting residents first. Then we have key objectives, which include uh, bullet two, help those most in housing need, and bullet three, resident, reward residents with a long attachment to the borough. And bullet uh, four, five, sorry, make the best use of Hennington's social housing stock. Um, then, uh, just below halfway down the page, the social housing allocation system will be supported by a housing options approach, giving applicants realistic advice in proposing other housing options. We in due course say that's one of the safety valves, so you get, the, and that's consistent with uh, what we say about, uh, with, with the statutory scheme about advice and assistance. Um, and three paragraphs up from the bottom. Uh, the council will continue to use the private rented sector within the bar and outside to meet statutory housing obligations. Then we have over the page, um, section two is eligibility and qualification for housing. This follows the framework of the legislation. It has the eligibility rules. Then it has the qualification rules. 2.2. .2. Um, and then they set out 2.2.1 at 174, households with no demonstrable housing needs will not qualify. Uh, and the, 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 the scheme of these um, qualification criteria is to set out the disqualification accompanied by, and, and then the exceptions. Each one has an exception. And then 2.2.2, Household with sufficient financial resources will not qualify. Again, there are exceptions to that. 2.2.3, households that not currently live in the borough, no need to move there, exceptions to that. And then 2.2.4, which is central to these appeals. Households who have been continuously living in the borough for at least 10 years will not qualify to join the housing register. Um, that's the rule to which there are firstly a number of deeming provisions, uh, cases where a person will be deemed to be uh, resident, even though they're physically not. And then over the page, we have 10 exceptions to that rule. Sorry, just one moment. So we have uh, ten exceptions, and the sixth, my lord, is statutory homeless persons and other persons who fall within the statutory reason and preference groups. That's Hindenden complying with the Jacobin suit case, which says that you've got to include all the reasonable preference categories um, within. So anyone with a reasonable preference gets through the ten year. Uh, where they go, question of banding is another question, and I'll show you that in a moment, but they do go through the gateway. Section 3 is concerned who can make an application. Section 4 complies with the um, statutory requirements to set the policy on uh, choice-based lettings, meaning an operator choice-based scheme. Section 5 of page 178 sets out the priority banding. Band A for very severe, emergency, very severe housing need cases. Band B for those with urgent need to move. Band C for those with an identified housing need. And then 5.2 deals with priority dates and conventionally Hillingdon um, has a first on, first served, waiting, uh, a, a waiting time. Uh, we'll look at that in, in, in due course. Um, and then at page 183, section 6, is allocations outside.
outside choice based letting, I took the court to the statutory power to do this, and it's what's known generally as direct offers. So it's basically a choice based scheme. You look at an advert for a property, you phone up and you bid for it, but the local authority can make a direct offer. It has to be suitable. And one of the circumstances in which they can do that, bit the way uh, just before, halfway down, was where homeless households have been in temporary accommodation for longer than the average period, there will be made one direct offer of suitable accommodation. That's a safety valve, you say. And then if we can go to uh, page 189, 10.9, appeal against the decision applicants have a right to ask for a review of any decision made under the terms of this policy, which they do not agree. That's a safety valve. Then, uh, page 191, the reasonable preference groups. homeless go into bands A to C depending on the nature of their accommodation. But if they don't have 10 years, then over the page, they go into band D. Where the council has been unable to prevent homelessness, the main homelessness is going to be accepted. Applicants with less than 10 years will be placed in band D. So this gets you up a band. If you're within bands C or B, it gets you up uh, by one band. And that's an exercise of the power that we looked at to give additional priority amongst the reasonable preference uh, groups. And then just note, 14.4 is working households. That was also under challenge before both judges below unsuccessfully in each case. And then finally, can I just go to paragraph 18, page 204, changes to the scheme, a review of the policy will be carried out periodically. And this is a, 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 a living thing, it's under constant review by the uh, local authority, and it's currently under review because of the changes introduced by the Homelessness Reduction Act. They're not materials. I'm just going to give, I want to, I want to make progress, so I'm just, if I may. Yes, uh, just reflecting, I think I was ruder than I meant to be when I said <laughs> that you were taking me to, to provisions that didn't seem to be relevant. I think uh, it's premature of me to say that, and probably will turn out to be wrong. It's entirely unnecessary. I'm, I'm prepared to be told to do whatever. Right, but um, uh, keep going. Um, 
I, I, um, and there's a lot for me to get through. I've got a yes, lady. Right, right. No, no, you're doing well. Um, so I'm going to give references where, um, yep. where, 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 where you safely do so. Um, we make a point in our skeleton, paragraph 25, about the rights of band D at the time. All I need to say is that the rationale for band D, band D is the statutory homeless who do not have 10 years. And the rationale for putting them in a lower band is because, as we've seen, Statutory homeless have collateral rights. For example, not least, they have the right to be provided with suitable temporary accommodation while they await an allocation. And they have the right to be considered for a PRSO. A PRSO is a not bad thing. Some people are very pleased to be offered a PRSO. Uh, and Miss Murphy deals with that in um, Paris 28 to 29 of her witness uh, statement, which is that... Um, SBTW, Supplementary Bundle TW, Tab 1, page 8. And also, at paragraph 44, she sets out the rights of an applicant to go to the hardship panel. And as a demonstration of that, uh, EM, in this case, made an application to the hardship panel. So it shows, we say, that that safety valve works uh, in the event it was found that EM did not have um, housing need to justify a higher banding. And finally... Um, sorry, I, what was the other paragraph you referred to? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, it was... Paragraph 8, um... Uh, I'm sorry, page 8. Uh, paragraphs of Miss Murphy's statement. Yep. 28 and 29 and 44. Thank you. Thank you. And also paragraph 31, because Miss Murphy makes the point um, that... Uh, Nowadays, you don't necessarily get accommodation for life under Part 6. What you get in Hillingdon, typically, is you get a one-year introductory tenancy. And if all goes well, that's followed by what's known as a flexible tenancy, which is a fixed term, typically of five years, which is renewable. Um, and this is part of the new, uh, the, the, the move in central government policy away from uh, accommodation for, for, for life. Sometimes people need social housing because of a an emergency in their life, which doesn't necessarily, um, and it may be seen as unfair to, 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 uh, to provide accommodation for life in those circumstances. So, so uh, I, I hope that's not too garbled that Paul doesn't understand it, but that, that, that's, that, that's the scheme. I, obviously, I'll come back to that in due course. Um, can I go now then to the uh, Briefly, because I know the court's very familiar with it, the Framework of the Equality Act, which is tab two. <clears throat> I'm confident I can save some time here. Uh, so... Um, The, the, the claimants in both cases, tab two, the claimants in both cases uh, rely on the twin pillars of sections 29 and 19. 29 is the provision of services. And it's common ground that part six allocation is a certain function, so section 29 is engaged. And that simply says the service must be carried out without discrimination. So that engages section 19. Um, it, it, I'll take the court through any of these if uh, members wish me to do so, but I'm taking them. This is all very familiar. They're very familiar. We may need... I'll make submissions in due course. When I get if to there had been an issue about... Um, peculiar particular disadvantage. We might no, want to look very no, carefully no, at 2A, but there isn't. So we'd really, it's really just 192D, yeah. which we're calling justification for short. We, we are. We are. I'm grateful. So uh, the only references I guess, I'll simply give them. Uh, section 4 defines the protected characteristics. Section 9 elaborates on race. Section 13 defines the direct discrimination. Section 19, indirect discrimination. 
and I suppose we do need to note section 23. Oh. You were going, you're about to go there. I was about to go there. I'm very yeah. grateful to law um, 23 about the comparison. Yes. Um, that I, and uh, th 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 this um, uh, accounted for at least another hour's loss of sleep, Mr. Lane and I, about the, um, the ESOP point. Uh, yes, yes, fine. Yes. Um, So, uh, two uh, preliminary questions about justification. I'm grateful to the law for a very helpful focus on that. Um, firstly, the intensity. Now, we don't want to spend a lot of time on whether the manifestly without reasonable foundation test applies or not. The court will see that both judges address that issue, um, and Mr Justice Subson applied it in relation to working household. Mr Justice Mostyn very firmly found that it does apply. But um, I think he um, said what the court needs to see um, before it interferes with the local authority's decision is a strong and obvious case. It's a sliding scale and it's related to how intense the local authority's consideration well, can I just was. be clear about this? The manifestly without reasonable foundation formulation, I think, arises entirely from Strasbourg cases, doesn't it? It's yeah. not, well, you can tell me, I, I'm not familiar with the extent to which it has been brought into Section 19 cases. Um, but in a no, sense... I, I'm about to take the law to one of his own cases. Yes, quite. Um, but... Uh, um, can I, 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 yes, I, no, I, fine. I, I just wanted to flag that up as something that I'm, yeah, I, yeah. I'm interested in. I don't in. want to spend a lot of time on this yeah. because ultimately I don't think it's, it's fundamental. But I do, since the judges deal with this question, can I just um, simply firstly take the court to the case of Turley, which is at tab 28. we do this is because um, we say respectfully it's not such a question of so much a question of whether it comes in section 19 it's a question of whether social housing is uh, in that area that Strasbourg would say is subject to the test and this is a case uh, where the Lord gave the leading judgment in a case concerning compatibility challenge to provision in the Housing Act uh, 1985 and again, if I could just flag up the paragraphs um, that uh, uh, paragraph 25, sorry, I'm so sorry, paragraph 20, paragraph 20, uh, the Lord Vice President um, says that a question has arisen as to whether the manifesto without reasonable foundation test applies to a housing case. He notes that the matter was uh, fully debated before the court. And then I, I shan't take time, but at Paris 20, 21, and then 25 and 28, um, the law yes, comes... Uh, sorry, just for the record, I think there's an oddity, and I remember noticing this too late to correct it, oh. that the first sentence of Paris 20 is odd because... Um, uh, it assumes what it eventually becomes the conclusion. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know, it's just an oddity in the drafting which I failed to pick up. But anyway, it doesn't well, matter. We, we just offer it up as an example very close uh, to our case in terms of housing scheme, uh, the housing, uh, the Court Policy Housing Scheme, where the Court has, on full um, submissions, uh, concluded that they, the manifest interest uh, applies. But the, but the case I will spend a little bit more time on um, is the case but I... Mean, is, is, that a, is that because it is housing? Or is that because it is a decision taken by 
in this case Parliament, uh, faced with a number of different choices which it has considered. And it, in other words, is it just the field of endeavour which attracts the test, or is it something to do with the process by which the decision is reached? Well, there's an overlap with the principle of deference. Um, I think Strasberg instead um, put it in terms of uh, social and economic policy, mm. where there's a wider margin of appreciation. And Paul Justice said he grappled with the problem of translating Strasberg state level principles to local issues here. I don't want to speculate. But, yes, but the, uh, so far as Turley is concerned, I clearly thought at 25 it was the latter. Well, it's, <laughs> it's both, but it is essential. I say at Para 25, I see no difference in access to social housing and access to welfare benefits, which was um, both represent public resources, in the case of social housing, particularly scarce resource, the conditions for access to which must be preeminently a matter for political judgment. So uh, it looks as though, insofar as Turley is applicable here, which may be disputed, it's because you're making political, not necessarily party political, but political yeah. judgments about allocation of resources. Yeah. Um, that, uh, and I think that's um, that reverberates in what I think uh, Lord Justice Brooks said. But I, mean, I just offer it up just to, just to show a case yeah, that, that we say is, 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 is close. But can we look, please, at tab 9, the Armour case? Armour is a case that uh, we find widely cited in part six cases. And um, it, it was essentially a rationality challenge to Newham's very simple three-banded allocation scheme. Newham had a very, very simple scheme, three priority bands, and within each band, the priorities were determined according to waiting time. And the argument was that you will have families with multiple needs, more than one reasonable preference, who are beaten by somebody who's simply been on the list longer, and that can't be right. And to be fair, on existing authority, that was a strong point. And it initially um, appealed to Lord Scott. But resoundingly, the committee rejected the argument and dismissed the appeal. Um, and in so doing, um, they allowed the appeal. I'm so sorry. Okay. They allowed the appeal. They dismissed the argument. They allowed the, <laughs> they allowed the appeal. It's very good. Yeah. Important. Um, dismissed the claimant's argument. And again, to save time, um, can I just invite the court to note first it will stop. Three to four. Where he said uh, essentially, um, what's the option? That time waiting is as good a fact as anything else. Then uh, Baroness Hale, um, I think the court has the tram lines, paragraph 12. I'll, I, I, I'm going to pass over this because. If we get on, if and when we get on to Article 14, this passage in Baroness Hale's judgment is of particular importance. So if I may, I'll come back. But I just want to pick up, for present purposes, just a couple of uh, references. At page 638 of the report, after the citation of authority, Baroness Hale says, The trouble is that any judicial decision basically is bound to be on facts of a particular case. The greater weight should be given to one fact. So sorry, 638, which paragraph? Between C, uh, it's 15. Yes, between C, C and D. Got it, yes, thank you. Uh, typically, it's not uh, my fault here, not Tranmer. The, tip, uh, the trouble is that any judicial decision basically is bound on the facts of a particular case. The greater weight should be given to one fact or particular accumulation of factors 
means the lesser weight perhaps given to other factors. Ford has no position to rewrite Hong Kong's equal weight claims to the multiple group of not short Ford against the claims of the few who are. And then to similar effect, Lord Newberger at 26 it seems unlikely the legislator could have intended judges to embark on the exercise of telling authorities how to decide on priorities as between applicants to free housing, saving relatively rare and extreme circumstances. 51, where it commends Newman's scheme for being, uh, albeit rough and ready, nonetheless very clear, relatively simple to administer and highly transparent. That's something we rely on when we have uh, later arguments in this case. And six, 62. That's a case which is often cited. Um, at the weighing up, the balancing exercise of the proportionality test under section 19 in terms of deference. And then um, finally, before I come to the judgments and the grounds of appeal, the case that I think we put in our um, recommended advance reading, and it's the Queen on the application of H against Nun by Ealing, which is tab 30, and uh, of which uh, Lord um, Vice President was a member. This is very close to us, actually, because it's a judicial review challenge to uh, provisions in a social housing uh, allocation scheme. And it's brought on a number of grounds, including Section 19, uh, Article 14, Section 11 of the Children Act, and, se and the Public Sector Equality uh, uh, Again, to save time, if I could give references for highlighting, because I will come back to this in my submissions. Um, if, if it's difficult to follow, please tell me, and I will make progress. Um, essentially, um, this was a challenge to two uh, measures contained in uh, Ealing's scheme. One was known as the Working Household Priority Scheme. You see this in paragraph one of the Master of the Old Judgment. Uh, priority housing, uh, a Working Household Priority Scheme. It said that that discriminated against women, elderly, and the disabled. And a Model Tenant uh, Priority Scheme, MCPS, which was said to discriminate against non council And if we look over the page, page 548, paragraph 8 of the judgment, we see that the way Ealing had arranged things was to set aside 20% of their stock for these two schemes. So one fifth of Ealing's stock was set aside, ring fenced, for these two schemes. Uh, that's the equivalent of about 80 odd lettings a year for Hillingham. 15% um, of which went to the working household and 5% to the model tenant. And um, Ealing had been unsuccessful below before Judge Waxman, as he was. Remember Judge Waxman, PC. Um, and um, what Ealing argued before this court was that there was no discrimination under uh, Section 19 because of all the safety valves in their scheme. And that was rejected. And it was rejected for reasons that the Master Roll sets out because when you look at Section 19, you have to focus on the words of that section and nothing else. And if there's prima facie discrimination, then you move on to justification. And it was that finding, that judgment, 
which caused Mr Laid and I, on reflection, to make the concessions we made in these cases about the residency provisions being capable. We looked at what the Master of the Rolls had said. We, too, were relying on safety valves, but we realised we couldn't pray those in aid on the question of prima facie discrimination, but we could in relation to justification. Um, and... Um, And that, that, that's, that says the old page, uh, paragraphs 58 and 59. 59 is the ratio, we say, of the case on this, on this point. Contradictory of eating to concede on the one hand, the purposes of section 19.2, that the WHPS and the PCP, and on the other hand, seek to uh, rely on um, safety valves. What this highlights is that the matters on which eating relies, the safety valves, are matters which properly are relevant to justification of the section 19.2b. So in short, you can't rely on safety valves to negate indirect discrimination, no. but you can rely on them to justify it. It's exactly that we just said, exactly that. And that's, that's why we made the uh, concessions in both cases. Um, because we, 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 were, we were bound in the light of this decision to focus simply on 2.2.2, for example, in the policy, and ask whether that on the face of it discriminates before we could look at other things mm -hmm. such as direct offers and hardship and all of that. That's the way we constructed our case. We say that uh, we, we did, it didn't find favour with Mr Justice Mostyn, who refused our, um, our concession or refused to accept our concession uh, on that. Um, but, uh, but, but we, we stick to it nonetheless. You might say refused to follow authority by which he was bound. Um, but, uh, if somebody behind me will argue that, but uh, sorry be behind me. But, uh, um, Now, um, can I move on then to the judgments under appeal? Again, I mean, I, I, I would anticipate that the court has um, had the opportunity to look at these. Not only so, had it. I'm sorry. Not only had it, but taken it. And, uh, and also Mr Justice Mostyn. So, again, we need... And essentially, we'll come back to this, because Mr Squires, Mr Butler make a forensic point about what Mr Justice um, Suckstone actually found, but essentially we say that um, in relation to the main point, I'm, I'm so sorry, do you have the, um, do you get the reference, do you have the... Uh, I've taken them out and got them separately. Right. Right. It's tab six. I, I, it, 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 call one of tab six. He has a transcript. It, it's been reported. Would you oh. prefer, it's in the Housing Law Report, would you prefer copies of the Housing Law Report? My well, part, I've marked up the transcript. So yes, I'm going to stick with the transcript. I think, again, simply for judgment writing purposes, to give correct references and so on, it might be um, yeah. useful to have it. But uh, why not have yeah. them up at lunchtime? Yes. Um, well, I, this is Justice Supperstone first, are we? Well, yeah, we're, we're dealing with the Justice Supperstone appeal. Yeah. But obviously, Mr. Must, uh, Justice Mustin's Must, Must, Must judgment is, is relevant. But if we look at um, 2W number 1, uh, can I just, uh, paragraph 31 lists Hillingdon's concessions. We made a number of concessions, hopefully with a view to narrowing the issues. And then... Um, Forty-three, the judge looks at uh, Hillingdon's evidence and the 2013 impact assessment, which I'll come. Forty-eight, the judge uh, summarises our safety valve argument. And then the ratio on this part of the case begins at 50, real problem for the council in attempting to justify 10 years is the paucity and adequacy of the evidence. 51, 
reference to DH and Czech Republic, racial discrimination, particularly invidious kind of discrimination. And then there's, I'll come back to these in, when making good my submissions on ground one, but then the judge at 52 finds that in order to do this, that is to say justify under section 19, the authority must address the possible impacts of the measure. And there's reference to coal. We say that's a misdirection of law. I'll come back to that in a moment. And in 53, only consideration given to, uh, in relation to race is the BME or white residents. Um, and then last few, uh, sentence, no consideration therefore begins to whether the council has struck the correct balance. That's part of the ratio. So sorry, Rob. 53. So the ratio is at 50. Um, and then he gives, uh, the judge gives um, authorities to support that, 52, yeah. and I've highlighted that important line, in order to do this, that justify the authority must address the possible impacts of the measure, that's at 52. And then at 53, last sentence, no consideration therefore be given as to whether council has struck the correct balance between disadvantage to Irish travellers and the aims of residents required. The authorities make clear that deference to a decision maker's conclusion is proportionate, is only appropriate where balancing exercise between the discriminatory impact and the aim has been undertaken, in reference to the three authorities there. I'll come back to those. And then finally, at 56, the only work time that the judge deals with our safety valve argument on this ground, as the safety valves, um, not likely to benefit Irish travellers any more than those with other ethnic origins. No evidence councils considered whether they were likely to advantage persons who are Irish travellers over other individuals with an equal need for housing. So an effective safety valve, according to the judge, is one that peculiarly advantages Irish travellers over others of equal housing need. And then 59... Just as to structure... As you say, 50 starts by talking about the paucity inadequacy of the evidence, and that various aspects of that are followed through to 54 and 55. Then 56, we have the safety valves. What's the structure of it from then on? 57, 58 merely recite the fact that... Um, there is statutory guidance. Yeah. Then he refers to the evidence of Miss Leak from Shelter. Which again is just saying yeah. what the evidence is, doesn't express any opinion about it. Then 59, I'm just trying to try and see how, is this a sum, how does this fit into what we've seen before? Well, the, the, the judge finds that um, it's really it's find it's likely to have a significant adverse impact. No evidence. Again, it comes back. It's, 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 the, the single point is that it, it, which is encapsulated in fifty is there's no evidential basis to show that the local authority considered the impact specifically on Irish travellers. Well, there's two points really, aren't there? There's that, and I see why you rely on that for ground one, and we'll come back to it. Then further, there's no evidence from the council to show there's a shorter period than ten years would yeah. undermine their stated yeah. objectives. Yeah. Had it been the case for the claimants that it would have been the policy would have been lawful if it had been a shorter period? Well, we're not entirely clear about that. Um, we, we don't fully understand Mr. Wise will develop this in his well, submissions at ASA. It was floated before the judge that a period of five years, in fact, um, the claimants in their skeleton say. Are you talking about the skeleton below? No, I'm talking about the skeleton here, which is right. floated below, yes. um, that five years uh, might suffice. Right. Well, we'll ask Mr Wise about that. I was really just asking a question because you were there yeah. as, as to how it had been put. Because this looks as if it is meeting a point um, that, uh, that there was an alternative, namely five years, yeah. and the judge is... Um, saying you haven't uh, uh, shown any evidence that you considered that alternative. Well, as we've seen, due course, there is evidence that they considered um, in okay, the five you. to ten years. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I misstated. The point is that there's no evidence to show that it would undermine the objectives. Yeah. Yep. 
Thank you. And then um, six is the encapsulation of that. And then the judge goes on to his work in the council. Um, you, you, Mr. Rutledge, your reading of what the judge has said in paragraph 52, 53, and 54 uh, is that the authority must address the possible impact of the measure before bringing the measure into effect. I think that's what the judge is saying. That's how it it's pretty ambiguous. If, if sorry, the judge so meant that in order to justify the measure, the authority must address the possible impact of the measure at some stage, even before the court, would you be quarrelling with it? Um, well, we'll see authorities which say that they, they, they can do that. Yes. Um, so if that's what the judge meant, if he meant you, ha you Hillingdon, have not tried to justify the impact of yeah. this PCP on Irish travellers, either before we adopted the requirement or indeed when challenged yeah. in this judicial review, yeah. he would be right. No, we, we say as a matter of law, and I'll take it over to authority in a moment, right. um, even a failure to assess at any time, at whatever point, does not deprive the court of the, uh, the, 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 the court should not grapple with the question of whether the um, discriminatory measure is objectively justified. Or bad. I don't, I'm not um, sure I entirely understand that. The, the statute says clearly that the burden is on you to show, yes, to sure. show the measure yes. is proportional, yes. or justified rather. If you don't adduce evidential material to justify it, yes. how can the court say objectively that yes. it is justified? Well, well in first, he, sorry, I'm not trying to avoid the question. In first, the, there is evidence here, right. evidence that was before the judge. Um, on which he could and should, we say, have grappled and, and, uh, and asked himself whether objectively this is justified. So we're not in that area. Uh, my Lord's absolutely right, the burden is on the policy maker um, to show that it's justified. But the authorities do suggest that you, that you can construct a case, I'm not recommending this, at court if necessary, you on justification. They say you can construct, you don't mean the court can. No, 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 quite right. The yes. onus isn't on the court. No, I'm, I'm, I'm not really disputing that. I no. I'm well see that. You can, yeah. you can justify a measure of I don't dispute fact. that as a factual law. But you've got to do it. Yes. But here we say what was the, did, we say it's, it's, it's clear that what Mr. Justice Upstone was doing was he's looking back at the, um, at the time of the creation of the measure and so asking... Yeah, well, we're, we're really slipping into round one. And yeah. if, if you... Uh, either let's deal with round one right now, in which case yeah. I'm sure my Lord and I, I certainly want two more questions to ask you about that. Or was there other ground you wanted to cover before you dropped to round one? Well, only Mr. Just... Uh, well, uh, it, it will come back if necessary. Um, or we will come back to deal with... Uh, look at the way Mr. Just Substance dealt with section 11. Well... I don't see any point in really trailing it and then doing it. Let's just do it. It's, it's up to you. But, I mean, what I understand you're doing, you're taking us through the judgment, flagging up points which you're then going to come back and deal with in relation to the ground. Yeah. Is that a useful use of time? Why don't we just I go straight to the point grounds? I, I take the Is that Well, it, then can we look at ground one? Because my Lord has opened it up. Um, I is this a fair summary of where you are on round one? That you say the judge didn't, you say one, you did in fact mount a, an ex post facto justification, which the judge didn't consider. Instead, he put you down because there wasn't a contemporary justification. So that really involves us seeing what the judge's reasoning process was. Yes. Para 50 is ambiguous on this point. doesn't say anything about at the time. Uh, para 52 is certain, 
where it says, in order to do this, the authority must address the possible impacts of the measure. Yeah. And you just said, when going through it, that was a misdirection. But it would only be a misdirection if it meant the authority must have addressed the possible impacts of the measure at the time. It's not what it says. And then, however, I think you do get some help from uh, 59, which appears to be a summary paragraph, and the penultimate sentence of which says, however, there is no evidence that the council sought to assess the extent of the disadvantage of Irish travellers yeah. or consider whether it was justified or what might be done to reduce it. Yeah. That is your only paragraph, the only passage where, they, where he appears to be saying explicitly that his ratio for refusing for uh, allowing the claim is that you Didn't do it, at the time. It, it wasn't done at the time. Is is that a fair summary, or are there other passages you need to refer to to show what the judge's reasoning was on this on on the ground one issue? Well, that, it was 52 that I took you to, yeah. wasn't it? 52, sorry, 52. 52 is the quoting Lady Hale in the call. Yes. And the passage in the call is all about whether the uh, MOJ had justified um, different provision for men and women yeah. at any stage was not restricted to whether they had done so before introducing the PCP under attack. Well, if, you, if you look at what she says, yes. um, at 41 and 42 in Col, tab 19, um, Lady Hare records that Miss Rowe continues to be the women. Except in principle, <coughs> the different provision might be possible. Her complaint is the MJ has never properly addressed its mind to the problem, etc., etc. There are other options that could have been considered, and so on and so forth. It is for the Secretary of State to show that discrimination is justified. The Ministry has not assessed the possible impacts on women. And therefore, cannot show. I mean, this is nothing to do with when this well, exercise is going to take place. This is they just haven't done it at all. Well, safe to say, my lord, I'm sorry, safe to say that what Mr. Justice Cranston said, going to the first of 42, was in the concept of compliance with the public sector policy duty, which was dealt with at the outset. Because the Secretary of State hadn't complied um, with um, his duties under the PSED, he couldn't therefore demonstrate. I mean, well, I think one has to be careful about a possible elision here between two senses of saying you can't rely on. Yeah. One is you can't rely as a matter of law, yeah. and the, uh, which I think somebody can maybe say. I don't detect anyone is saying that uh, the authorities say that if you don't do it at the time, you can't do it later. If they are, I should take some persuading that that's what the authorities say. Yes. But another sense, which we do see in Cole, and I think in some other cases as well, Elias is an example, yes. is, well, if you didn't do it at the time, it becomes much more difficult for yes. you to do it later. Yes for all sorts of reasons, one of which is purely forensic, which is that t what tends to happen in these cases is that the council or the local authority, the authority, the public authority, turns up with its public, with its impact statement, which yes. was done at the time, and argues the case on that basis. Yes. So it's very easy in those cases to find the two concepts slipping into one another, and the court may say he can't rely on it because the impact statement didn't show that he considered the right points or whatever. Uh, but that's not because of any problem with law. That's just because that's the only evidence they rely on. 
And I think we have to be careful in seeing whether, uh, in some of the authorities, and indeed in Mr. Supperstone's judgment, Mr. Justice Supperstone's judgment, where he does say, but you didn't look at it at the time, he's really making an evidential point rather than a uh, bad point of law. Sorry, that was a long speech, but I think that is... No, it was it, 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 it's helpful. I, 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 I'm just wondering whether the point that the Lord um, put to me uh, is uh, the one that's encapsulated in Lord Kerr's judgment in the Brewster case oh, um, about um, post hoc logic. And... Um, Tab is that, Mr. Rubbish? Uh, yes, I'm so sorry. It's tab 18 at paragraph 51. Do you say paragraph 18? No, it's tab 18, yes, paragraph, uh, paragraph 51. Yes, the, yeah, I that, that's the Lord's point, that if it is uh, 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 post hoc logic or, or um, uh, retrospective um, judgment, um, then um, a greater degree of judicial scrutiny would be applied. But nonetheless, well, I'm not sure it might. Yeah, yeah, I see it is a point. Yeah, isn't it? yeah. So well, I, I don't want to. I, I, well, of course, answer the court's questions. I don't want to run on this um, too much. The gist of our case under ground one is that the judge did not, whether it was um, because, and we do respectfully say that property rates judgment the same, it's because they failed to do it at the outset. Um, it was doomed um, thereafter. But in any event, we didn't grapple with the evidence. Before. Yes, I we see. So, uh, see the it would be wrong to see ground one as purely a point about a misdirection yeah. on the relevant... Yes, I see. Yes. Yes, I, I'm well, anxious, in the time I've got, yes. I'm anxious that the court sees the evidence that the judge looks at um, as to whether what he said um, within the context of that evidence is the, uh, 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 that the So what I'm writing down is it's not essential to ground one that the judge misdirected himself. by reference to, so by insisting only on contemporary justification, whether he did or not, he failed properly to consider the justification advanced. And, I, and you're going to make that good. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> I, I mean, just to remind you, that's because the judge's mind was focused very much on the consideration of travellers specifically rather than um, racial victim. I, I want to take the court to the evidence. Yes, sir. That was before the, um, the judge. I, I'm... Um, I, I, I was going to take the court to the cases that Mr Justice Substone refers to, but the, it, it, with respect, it's clear that the Lord has the point, has encapsulated the point that we make in our skeleton about um, old cold and, and, and Elias and cases of that nature. The Lord's just... just um, yes, 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 right. It was all in your... So rather oddly, you refer to... Not oddly, but you refer to Harrod, which... In, I think that uh, decision of the your, your main authority you rely on is the decision of the uh, EAT, yes, um, which is not not binding on us. And no, of course not. It's helpful. Uh, and but you you've done that simply as a way into these other cases. Yeah. Which are walking up well, case. we say it's a very helpful encapsulation. Yeah. Of the principle. That's why we, we do that. Yeah, just 
Um, the, the evidence is to be found in the joint supplementary bundle. Can I just say on timing that I've given myself about 15 minutes to do section 11. Um, I want to get on to safety valves, but I'm anxious that the court looks at the evidence. Once yes, we look at the evidence, we do. The, the submissions will become fairly clear. Yes. And I'm hoping that I will give myself sufficient time to deal with safety valves. But let, let, let. Um, I will say as much as I can without leaving it for reply, uh, so that my opponents understand the case. Yes. Well, it's entirely up to you. I, if it's important for us to have colour copies, you better give them well, to us. We haven't, no. The graph at 7B uh, is important. Let's just see how we go. I think if you can hopefully follow my submissions. Yep, keep going. And then we'll furnish the court with them. This is the 2013 impact assessment. Yes. And what's being assessed here, amongst other things, is the impact of introducing the residence requirements. Yes. And uh, we look at the first page, step A, description of what is to be assessed and its relevance to the quality, changing of policy. And then we see it's dated the 25th of March 2013, and it's carried out by two officers. And then it firstly records at A1 the main aims of the benefits that you're assessing, which include rewarding residents with long-term attachment to the borough. Over the page, page 2, at A2, it identifies the service users affected by what they were assessing. And they say in the first box, uh, in A2, service users affected are residents who are currently on the housing register and those who will apply to the Council for Housing Assistance. And then their quality profile is set out below. And as of January 2013, there were 11,520 residents on the housing register. That was pre-residence conditions. So there were a lot of people on the register. And then there's a breakdown in Table 1 um, by ethnicity and gender into four groups. White, BME, other and unknown. What, what would be covered by other? Well... Um, we say that that would include, or certainly included within those, would be um, Irish travellers. Uh, and why? But they're white, are they? Well, they, 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 um, they, they, they might be. Part of the difficulty is that not everybody self-declares. Not everybody washes. washes. Yes, but if they don't self-declare, they come under unknown, don't they? Well, they might do, yes. I mean, I can't. I, I didn't shy away from the fact that there was no express uh, uh, reference or consideration of um, Irish travellers. Yes, I'm sorry. I, I wasn't really trying to make any particular point. I was just trying to understand. White means... Th these are based on how people have self-declared, by yes. definition. But, but why, I don't think we're shown anywhere what choices they're offered. Are they just offered these three choices? In which case we can't speculate. Yes, I mean, there's only so much information that the local authority takes on a housing. Yes, no, no I, sorry, it's just a simple factual question. On the returns for, on which this is based, are these just the four choices, or has some work been done by the council to reduce them? Do you follow me? I do. Can I return something if we can take and come back? Because in, <clears throat> in table two on the same page, somebody has declared themselves to be other EEA multi. Uh, yes, I mean, all, uh, that would be that would be information that would come in on the eligibility, uh, because. Well, I said it's breakdown by ethnicity and bed size, B, whereas the form table one is ethnicity and gender. So yes. it's quite why other EEA mortar crops up in bed. Uh, I, 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 table one is not readily explicable. No, no, I, I can't explain that either. I've looked at that. I think you may have had some instructions about, or maybe you haven't, about the question I raised.
that I'm told that the uh, council wasn't aware about it in 2013. It wasn't what? Wasn't aware about it. Can I, wasn't aware about what? Can I, can I clarify this a yeah, little bit? Yes, but just to be clear what the question is. The question is just a straightforward question. Is, this, is what we see here, these four boxes, yes. the four bo or the three boxes, I suppose, the three options offered to people when they fill in the form, or is it, or is it someone, council officers, having reduced them to a smaller number of categories from a larger? I'm not asking you to answer the question now, but that's a question that would be useful okay. to have answered. Okay. Well, have Thank you. And then, uh, if we go to page four, uh, question A3, who are the stakeholders in this assessment? What is their interest? Stakeholders, residents, interest they may gain or lose their housing priority as a result of the changes. A4, what are the protected characteristics? Sorry, is residents right? Surely this means people on the housing register, doesn't it? Well, what it says in... Um, oh, I see, it just means residents of Hillingdon. Yes. Oh, I see. Yes. You the service think? users, but residents of who will apply to the council. I should just have said that uh, page two, it says the ethnicity breakdown of the households broadly reflects the social and economic demography of the borough. And then uh, at page four... Um, a4, the box, shows that they're assessing, amongst other things, on the impact on race and ethnicity. And then they go through the various proposals at step B. And the one that we're concerned about in this case is the 10-year residence provision, which starts at page 7. They put at page 7, they set out the proposed policy. Table A looks at how it would impact in terms of numbers, overall in terms of numbers, with 10-year residency applied. And the bottom line there over at page 9 is that from a waiting list of 2,973, it will reduce it to 1,177. That's because at this stage they don't go on band D because there isn't one. This yeah. is because at this stage they come off entirely. They all come into that yeah. And then table 6B, which is the one that you may uh, benefit from a colour version, what this does is it looks at the likely impact. I mean, all of this is before they've introduced it, of course. Looking at the likely impact of a residence requirement on those four groups, white, BME, other, and unknown, uh, respectfully for years, or respectively for years five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And the clue to understanding this table is that in each column, as it were, the figures add up to 100%. So that if we've got five years, the composition of the housing register with a five-year um, residence requirement would be 47% white, 36% black, 8% other, 9% unknown. And then we can see how that changes through the years to 10 years, with white increasing, the proportion of white on the uh, register would increase to 55%, BME would fall down to 30%, and uh, other and unknown would remain reasonably constant. And then at table 6D, there's an impact, estimated impact of residence criteria based on five to ten years, and figures are given to illustrate in another way that approach. And if we go to page 13, there's consideration of additional priority. And then at 18... Sorry, do, do, where do you have to pick? Oh, I see. Sorry, page 13. Yep. Yep. And then we go to the assessment at page 18... 
they look at the negative impacts. And in the uh, against race ethnicity, they note, first paragraph, uh, introduction of a 10-year residence will have a negative impact on this group. In addition, it will mean new residents arriving to the borough and or country will not be able to access housing register for a period of 10 years. Then they look at the... Well, hang on, sorry. Can, can we just pick that out? Um, down to the words in addition, that's simply reproducing what we saw from the table. Yep. In a... The in addition bit, although it's put in about race, ethnicity, really doesn't reflect at all the figures that have gone before. It's a self-standing point. Yes. It talks about new residents arriving to the borough, which has got nothing to do with race or ethnicity at all. Am I not right? Yeah. Uh, although it's stating the obvious, it's a, <laughs> um, because that's what it's meant to do. Yes. Um, and or country... Um, it's incredibly uh, telescoped, but effectively that is acknowledging a uh, racial, well, I don't know about ethnicity, it's a, a, na a nationality point. Yes. It's, well, it's a point about immigrants who by definition won't be British nationals. Yes. They may not be majority BME, they may mostly be white, um, the period we're looking at, there's a lot of uh, Eastern yeah. European immigration. Yeah. Yes, of course. So, uh, this is, I just really want to spell out what this is saying. It's not well, saying much, is it? No, uh, the second part of it, I'm going to... Sorry, yeah. Uh, Keep going. So they recognise that there's a potential negative impact on those groups. Uh, page 19, in the box, Community Cohesion... Those registered for housing are likely to be most economically disadvantaged, therefore contain over-representation of households in the protected groups. Families with children, single parents, families with disabilities, households from ethnic minorities, access to social housing from various groups will be monitored and reviewed to ensure that any potential discrimination is addressed. And then they move on to their conclusions. And can I just pick it up? Page 20, Action. Although we think the policy changes will not discriminate against some of the protected groups, it will only be possible to monitor this effectively once it is implemented. The information is not conclusive in determining whether there might be unintended consequences of the changes. Therefore, continuous impact monitoring will be carried out, which will be reported to members after a year of implementation. Assessment also shows the qualification rule in relation to 10-year residents could result in a number of households becoming excluded from the allocation, Residents who have not resided in Bath for more than 10 years, mainly BME residents, there will be a negative impact. In addition, new BME, BME rivals to the borough will be a negative impact. And then action dates has been provided on the estimated impact five to seven years. This can be reviewed and consider an option that would minimise the impact. So um, there's likely to be an impact. It requires monitoring once it's uh, put into operation and and uh, review. Can I um, move then to the second document in this bundle, which is the Cabinet Report, which goes with that assessment to Cabinet for the decision to implement. And um, at page 31, it deals with the housing allocation policy. There was, of course, my Lord, full consultation. There were two consultations. And we see at the foot of paragraph 31 that 77% of consultees supported the Council's proposals to only allocate accommodation to applicants who resided in Sorry, the borough. Page? Oh, I see. 31. 77% yes, yes. of consultees um, who responded expressed support for it. And then over to page 32, this is the report to Cabinet. Uh, local connection at the foot of the page. Council proposes that all other applicants would not generally be eligible for council accommodation. And then can they then 
33, fourth paragraph down, broadly speaking, the proposed changes will have a neutral effect on applicants with different ethnic origins. The priority that an applicant would have on housing depends entirely on the individual circumstances. Could, however, be argued that by requiring applicants to reside within the minimum of 10 years before they become eligible for accommodation, the council is indirectly discriminating against applicants from the BME background because the EAH shows the BME applicants are less likely to be entitled to have in the for 10 years. Indirect discrimination is under under Section 19 of the Equality Act. And then this, the proposed allocation policy recommends that exceptions to 10-year local connection requirement be made in appropriate cases, such as applicants who have been subject to domestic violence. An exception may also be granted where an applicant can demonstrate that they would suffer hardship if they were not considered for housing. And then next paragraph, second sentence, however, by permitting exceptions to avoid hardship, the council circumstances of all applicants can be cons fully considered and the possibility of an applicant suffering any disadvantage avoided. Further, by reviewing the operation of the allocations policy after one year, Cabinet will be able to consider whether any changes to the policy should then be made. So a fair summary we say, of the evidence at the time of the um, introduction um, of the residence uh, provisions was they looked at uh, its impact on the protected groups, including race. Um, they uh, realised that it, it, it may well have uh, negative impacts on certain groups. They couldn't say for sure until it had been implemented. Um, uh, but uh, uh, as a precaution against that, firstly, the scheme needed to be kept under review, and secondly, it had to uh, retain sufficient flexibility so that hardship could be um, addressed where it, it, it arose. Is there uh, any evidence about whether there was a review after the year? Uh, well, no, the, 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 there are two practical difficulties. No, there isn't, to answer your answer the question crisply. The two practical uh, the difficulties for Hillingdon in this case have been, A, the law changed between 2013 and 2015 with the Jakima suit case that I took the court to, which clarified that you've got to put all of the statutory homeless into the scheme. And since 2016, this policy has been under constant attack in judicial review proceedings. It was very difficult for the local authority to review. It attempted to do so after Mr Justice Sufferstone's judgment, uh, and, and, and that was unsuccessful. So the local authority hasn't. I said earlier that it's an ongoing process review. Um, but uh, we say, and I just want to pick up finally on that, um, what Miss Murphy said in her witness statement, Yeah, I don't think we have the cabinet minute one or for that one. We do for the, but they did, yes. yes. Um, can I just go to Miss Murphy's witness statement, um, which is at supplementary bundle, tab one, paragraph 11. I understand that Cabinet considered. I'm so sorry. Supplementary tab one, paragraph eleven. So we say there was a, a, a genuine attempt by the local authority 
to grapple with the not straightforward question of the impact of this residence requirement or these residence requirements on the various protected groups, including specifically roasts, um, breaking that down as best they could, realising that there was some impact or likely to be an impact, um, and uh, therefore alerting themselves to the need A, to keep it under review, and B, to retain sufficient discretion within the scheme. Uh, we say, with respectfully, that even though there's no evidence that Hillingdon looked specifically at Irish travellers, and the practical consequences of a rule of law which says that a policymaker has to look at impact on every conceivable group affected by it, are, are uh, we say, uh, immeasurable. But we say um, that that's evidence on which the judge um, could and should have looked and asked himself whether in the light of it and what followed, um, not least the terms of the policy and the safety valves, whether the discrimination was objectively justified. Uh, that, in a nutshell, is our argument on, on ground one. There might, there, there might be two separate questions. One is whether Killingdon carried out an adequate in the quality impact assessment such as for instance to comply with the public sector equality. Yeah. Uh, and you may well be right in saying that the policy maker need not look at every conceivable group in yes. carrying out that exercise. But if somebody from a group which has been overlooked then pops up and says, well, hang on a minute, what about me? Yeah. Um, might it not then be for the policy maker to say, well, we didn't consider your group specifically, but now that you raise it, yeah. this is why we think that the discrimination which affects you is justified. Yeah. Lord, where we answer that? Because that you haven't done, uh, as, 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 in the evidence, as far as I can see it. TW Not until says, the officer's review, which is off-limits, so exactly. far as this case. Yes. So, so TW says, well, you may have looked at BME and yeah. white and other ethnic yeah. groups, you may have looked at age groups, yeah. but you didn't look at my group. No. And you, Hillingdon has not answered that. He's not said, well, it wouldn't have made any difference, or uh, there are so few of you that it really doesn't, that the, that the discrimination yeah. is justified, or all sorts of things that could have been said, yeah. but have yeah, I'll go from law for that clarification. Hillingdon's case on that is that it anticipated that sort of problem at the time and therefore wrote in sufficient discretion in its scheme. Yeah. It comes down to the safety valve. There may well be problems that we haven't anticipated. We therefore need to make sure that that's, and this is the crucial, but this is the very heart of our defence on justification, is what's in the scheme, and it can cater for these um, issues when they arise. So if an Irish traveller comes up not having been anticipated as a particular yeah. group, and says, I have a peculiar problem which is related to my race, yes. namely uh, uh, take a case not unlike the present one, that uh, I'm in my 20s, uh, my childhood was mostly spent travelling because that was my culture and in practice that was my parents' culture because they dictate where I live. Uh, now I want to settle down and I shouldn't be at a disadvantage um, compared with uh, uh, people who've been here for 10 years because I had no choice about being mobile um, because of my parents' ethnicity. Are you saying that that could be dealt with under the hardship provision? Well, um, I just want to see how the safety valve actually would work yeah, in such a case. I understand that. I understand that. And this comes down to the fundamental issue on ground two, is what is the purpose of the safety valve? Is the safety valve there to um, uh, compensate any disadvantage that might generally arise as a result of a person's uh, cultural or ethnic background or whatever?
there, or is it uh, in general terms, or is it there to compensate in terms of housing need, or, or, or to, 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 to provide um, give discretion to the local authority to award greater priority where those problems manifest themselves in a way that impacts on housing need. That's the essential difference. We say the latter. We cannot, we cannot introduce a, a, a provision into this scheme to compensate somebody for, un, for discrimination solely on the grounds of race because that would be direct discrimination against others. We can't, for example, to take, I think it was Justice Substone's example, we can't say, okay, it's five years for Irish travellers, ten years for everyone else. Because everyone else would then be discriminated against directly. And that's the problem here. We answer your Lordship's question directly by saying it's the safety valve. An effective safety valve is this. If, as a result of a person's protected characteristics, their housing need becomes more acute, an effective safety valve is one that can address that heightened need. Yes. That's our Okay, case. right. In that case, we have to face up the fact it's not really a relevant safety valve as regards the factor complained of, the fact, or the factor that's operating. The factor that's operating is that Irish travellers, more than anyone else, or disproportionately, um, don't have a fixed residence. They don't have a history of a fixed residence. Um, but that, in a sense, is that, that doesn't make them more or less at housing need. It means that they may be just the same at housing need. And um, allowing them up to the hardship yeah. process wouldn't address the particular point which creates the problem. Well, I think you're accepting that and saying that's insoluble. Well, we, are, we are accepting that, but we are saying that this is a housing allocation scheme. This is not a policy to assist Irish travellers or homely gypsies or any other group like that. It's not a, the, the local authority right. have other statutory functions in that regard. This is simply, pure and simple, a housing waiting list. And therefore they can only allocate accommodation according to housing need. If those problems manifest themselves in that way, then the scheme needs to be able to address them. And this well, one does. I'm wondering whether the justification the safety valves are really relevant to the justification. There may well be a justification in such cases. I'm not saying there is or there isn't, but just conceptually a, a justification to say, I appreciate that this particular racial group, because of one particular characteristic, yeah. um, is more at risk, is, is, sorry, is, is likely to be disadvantaged because yeah. they'll be less able to qualify, proportionately. Yeah. But I'm afraid that's just outweighed by the other benefits of the scheme, uh, namely... Uh, the weight we want to put on a local connection. That would be a justification one could understand, yeah. but, it, but it's not to do with safety valves. I don't think it's quite how the council has put its case. You may want to think about that. Yes, I, I, I'm, I'm, I may be wrong, but I mean, that, that's... Yeah. I mean, some difficulty with timing. Um, yes. I, I could ask Mr. Burton whether he might... Well, can you all have a, a, a discussion? Um, I'm, sometimes it's because the court has asked you an unexpectedly large number of questions. I don't actually think that's the case. We've asked you some, as we're bound to no, do. No, I'm not saying that. No, I know you're not. But um, I'll just make this observation. The advocate going first needs the most time because you've done a lot of just ground laying, yeah. which had to be done by someone. Yeah. Uh, and I would hope that those behind you and following you in the list will be prepared to give you some flexibility. But I think it's best discussed at the bar before we, rather than us imposing time tables. Yes. And your justification point really goes to both appeals, doesn't it? Oh, yes. Yes, yes. I, mean, I, I can be 
shorter on my response on the Goodwin appeal. I think you allowed yourself quite a lot of time. For, I think I probably for... did, and um, I, I, and I, but I think. Uh, you allowed yourself two hours for your Grulu That's response. also to reply on to Well, I understand, but replies don't normally take long. The same as and, and well, I, there may be room for you to... to uh, I, I, I'll see if my uh, colleagues can accommodate me for... Um, well, let's not do the negotiation yeah. now. Um, I, I would hope and expect they will be a little yeah. bit um, generous to you about stopping at 2.15. Yeah. But you may have to, to give up some of your time later in the hearing. So it's safe to say, my lord, we, 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 we were now pretty much through ground one and getting into ground two. There's an overlap. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, so let's we're let's that. Um, let's look again at two, and um, uh, we will have today at least to stop uh, firmly at four thirty because I at least have other commitments at at four thirty, but luckily nearby. Right. Thank <clears throat>